uh, just literally flew in uh, from, in two and a half weeks, England, Ireland, Germany, Turkey, Turkmenistan, Iran. <laughs> and so I'm a little crispy around the edges. <laughs> so we might get a little loopy here tonight. So I'll try to remember, okay, it's not, we're in Texas, so it's yo y'all, okay? Because I've been through so many languages in the past couple of weeks. Okay, let's see what's happening here. Oh, and where is, the, huh? It's probably working. We'll just trust that it's working. Uh, it is so awesome to be here with you tonight. Um, so much of my spiritual formation happened right here on this very ranch. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, two of the most important people in my spiritual development were Leland and Fran Paris, uh, who have been at this center for, oh, forever, since the beginning. <laughs> I joined them in California before we came here, and I just owe such a tremendous debt of gratitude to Leland and Fran and this place, it is awesome. So it's great to be back for a few days. Um, I'm not a big fan of Texas because I live in the Colorado mountains right up in the Rockies, you know, where God lives, okay? Now he does vacation and visit down this way. He passes through, but he really lives up in the Colorado Rockies. I really, that's been my experience anyway. Um, but I hope he'll be here with, I know he's with us here tonight. Okay, I want to share with you about the world and what God's doing in the world. Uh, but before we do that, we have to laugh. I'm really jet lagging and, and I really need to laugh, you know, to get going here. So what I do as I travel the world is I collect signs. Uh, you find funny signs all around the world. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to show you real signs I've collected. Here's supermarket signs. Boneless bananas. <laughs> Apparently, I've been doing bananas wrong for all my whole life. I didn't know that they had this kind. Lemons, perfect for orange juice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who's heading up these supermarkets, you know. Baby need beers and wines. <laughs> that's how, so that's how you keep the baby happy. <laughs> baby needs beers and wines. Open nine days a week. <laughs> they had a real problem understanding the very nature and warp and woof of the universe and the time-space continuum there, you know. Special, this is our American uh, educational system at work. He had to make a sign for cereal. So it starts out with S and then he crosses it out and then sure. <laughs> our American educational system at work. And then there are traffic signs. I found a bunch of traffic signs. Here's one. When you've arrived there, you are in the twilight zone. Once you get there, you can, it's like the Hotel California, you can check in, but you can't check out, you know, for those of you who are as old as I am, remember what that song is. How about, I love whoever, whichever government official did this, I thought, I just love them. It says soft shoulder, blind curve, steep grade, big trucks, Good luck. <laughs> Absolutely nothing next 22 miles. <laughs> I think that's in Arizona somewhere, you know. Now, if you live in a place where you need this sign, <laughs> it is time for you to move. <laughs> that is the truth, okay? <laughs> okay. Then there are warning signs. I've found some warning signs. Uh, I've recently, I've become friends in the past year and a half with just some awesome people in Australia, uh, a great church called Hillsong, and they've got some really cool musicians and stuff. And so I was down there with them hanging out, and we're in the underground, you know, and it says, uh, it's a Newcastle tramway. It says, touching wires causes instant death you know, on the skull and crossbones. And then it says, $200 fine. <laughs> like, how do you collect? I said, turn to my friend, like, Joel, how do you, how do you collect, <laughs> you know? Uh, warning signs. Here's, here's a neighbor of mine in Montana. God's gracing with some property up there. It says, pray and meet God. Trespass and meet him sooner. <laughs> so I found some great warning signs. And then, uh, here's Zulon. Yes, there is a hell. <laughs> Talking to you, Rob Bell. Uh, it is in Michigan. 
And yes, it does freeze over. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> then I found some church signs, okay? I love the church signs. You know, we have to be able to laugh at ourselves, right? And so this is their Baptist church. Church parking only, violators will be baptized. <laughs> you know, I think that's when they put you down and don't bring you up, you know. Uh, here's a Methodist church. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> okay, now this, my little nieces and nephews love these things, kazoos. Okay, and I'm not a particular fan of the kazoo as a musical instrument that anyone should take up. And what's even worse than a kazoo is a kazoo in like the mouth of a five-year-old. <laughs> okay, so now I, try, I speak in a lot of big churches and I hang out with a lot of pastors and church people. And you know the biggest complaint amongst church workers is that parents will not come and pick up their children from childcare, you know, right after the service. They hang around in fellowship and they come late and all the church, all the childcare workers just go crazy. So one church had a solution to it. They put out this sign in front of childcare. It said, unattended children will be given a Red Bull and a free kazoo. <laughs> that got them to pick up their kids quickly, you know, after the service. And then we had some church sign wars, <laughs> you know, I forget if this is in Arkansas or Alabama somewhere, between a Catholic church and a Presbyterian church. The Catholics put up a sign that said, all dogs go to heaven. And the Presbyterians said, only humans go to heaven, read the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so the Catholics said, God loves all his creations, dogs included. And the Presbyterian says, dogs don't have souls, this is not open for debate. <laughs> So the Catholics said, Catholic dogs go to heaven, Presbyterian dogs can talk to their pastor. <laughs> so the Catholic church said, oh no, the Presbyterian said, converting to Catholicism does not magically grant your dog a soul. <laughs> so the Catholic said, free dog souls with conversion. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Presbyterian says, converting to Catholic, oh wait, I went backwards the wrong way. It says, dogs are animals and there aren't any rocks in heaven either, you know. So the Catholics said, all rocks go to heaven. <laughs> and then they started all over again. Okay, uh, I forgot to bring a watch. Can someone let me know the time and when I'm supposed to quit? throw something out. Can, is there a way for someone to give, loan me a watch or let me know what time I'm supposed to quit here tonight? You will let me know? Okay. Okay. Great. Let's talk about the gospel. Okay. We talk about, we use that word a lot, the gospel. Let's preach the gospel. I want to go hear the gospel. We've got to share the gospel, et cetera, et cetera. And we know in Greek, the go word gospel means good news. So when we're talking about preaching the gospel, we're teaching about bringing the good news to the world, okay? But you know what? What I ask people everywhere I go is I say, tell me the gospel message in one sentence, because I believe 99% of us have the gospel all wrong. And I say, so tell me the gospel in one sentence. And you know what I get? I get God is love, Jesus died for our sins, John 3, 16. These are all biblical messages, but they are not the good news. In fact, when I was in Bible school, they taught me, let the Bible define the Bible. The Bible will define what it means by the words it uses. And so uh, I was looking for the biblical definition for the gospel, and I found it in this passage where it says in Galatians 3.8, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham saying, Jesus is going to come and die for your sins. No, saying, all nations will be blessed through you. What kind of gospel message is that? That doesn't sound like what we've been hearing from our pulpits every Sunday. But yet in Galatians 3.8, it clearly says that the gospel 
uh, is what God said to Abraham when he said, all nations will be blessed through you. When that kind of exploded in my mind, I started looking in the New Testament. And I found other passages in Acts 3. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, preaching the gospel for the second time, said, I'm going to preach the gospel to you guys. Here it is. It's what God said to the prophets from Samuel on. As many as have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers when he said to Abraham. So for the second time, in the context of what the gospel is, whose name comes up? It's Abraham's name comes up for the second time. And Peter went on to preach, you know, uh, here it is, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. Again, quoting the same verse in the Old Testament that Galatians 3.8 quotes as what the gospel message is. Totally different than what we hear on most of our Sundays. In the book of Hebrews, you know what I found? I found again, the writer of Hebrews said, I'm going to talk about the gospel, and here it is. When God made his promise to Abraham, Abraham's name comes up again, saying, I will surely bless you and through you bless all the nations. God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. So three times in the New Testament, when the Bible starts talking about the gospel, it brings up the name of Abraham, and it says the gospel message is all nations will be blessed through you. Where's Jesus in that? I mean, I, I was confused for a bit until God began to give revelation, and I began to really understand what it was all about. I went back to the original passage. All three of these verses in the New Testament are pointing one, to one Old Testament verse. It's Genesis 12. Uh, verses 2 to 3. They're all quoting the same passage. In fact, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, are, is the most quoted scripture in the Bible by itself. The Bible quotes this verse more than any other verse. When you hear Jesus refer to verses, you know he often did, um, and other places in the Bible that refer to the Old Testament. This is the one that out of all of them are quoted more often than any of the others. God says, Abraham, I will bless you. And brothers and sisters, right here is the gospel message. The good news is not Jesus died for our sins. The good news is God is a God of blessing. He is not mad with us. He is not angry. He is not against us. He is not trying to punish us. He is an awesome God, full of tenderness, mercy, compassion, love. In fact, it says he casts our sin as far as from the east as from the west. His throne is founded on righteous and justice. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. And that came from faulty affixing to belt <laughs> due to jet lag. <laughs> He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He is a good God, a God of blessing. No religion in the world except ours has a God who wants to bless us. In every other religion, an angry God who wants to punish. We have to sacrifice people to the volcano so the volcano God doesn't burn us up. You know, Allah in Islam is not a happy God, you know, if you, if you uh, read the Quran and stuff. No religion, none, zero, has a God who wants to bless us except for our God and our religion. He is a God of blessing. And that is the good news. The good news is not Jesus died for our sins. The good news is even better than that. It is the nature and character of God himself. So that even though we were sinners, we were sinners, he came to help us. See, that's the, Jesus coming is the result of the good news. If God wasn't good, he wouldn't have sent Jesus. So Jesus is in there in that gospel message, right? But what is the message? I, I'm a God of blessing. I want to bless you. My heart is good towards you. I don't want to punish you. That's who I am, a God of blessing. But guess what? You will not, you will not keep that blessing to yourself. You will share this blessing. So all of you can, who want it can have the blessing because I'm a God of blessing. But guess what? You don't get to keep it to yourself. You will, you will, you will, you will share that blessing. And where are we supposed to share the blessing? All nations on earth will be blessed through you. So when we look at a biblical definition of the gospel uh, in Galatians 3.8, it says this is it, is that God wants to bless us and then through us bless all the nations of the earth. 
And so there's no way to actually become a believer and accept the blessing part without also at some point in our lives coming to the revelation that we're not supposed to keep it to ourselves and our purpose here on earth is to share that blessing to the ends of the earth. That's the gospel message. Blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. These are great scriptures like all of them are. Let me give you an example here in the Old Testament. The Jews, the Israelites understood this in the beginning. It says, they prayed this, may God be gracious to us and bless us. Make his face shine upon us. What an awesome prayer. I pray that every day. God, be gracious. Bless me. Make your face shine upon me. You're a God of blessing. Bless me. But they didn't stop there. They understood blessed to be a blessing. They said, so that, bless us, so that your ways may be known on the earth your salvation amongst all nations. That is the gospel message. Blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And I submit to you that as Christian, we cannot be a Christian living in the full expression of the gospel unless we receive the blessings of God, forgiveness of sin and everything else, but also are involved in some way in sharing with the nations. Now, 99% need to stay home. God's called you to stay home. 1% need to share uh, with the nations by going uh, into missions, but even a 99% at home, uh, your call from God is to bless the nations by sending missionaries, supporting missionaries, praying for missionaries, praying for the nations. We're blessed to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And you know what? Everywhere in scripture, God is a God of the nations. He wants all the nations to experience his blessing. And he has enough power to touch all the nations. I'm glad that I have that deep in my spirit when I look at the world. Anyone notice the world's not doing so good right now? Any of you notice that? I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. I'm going to put in perspective to you what's happening in the world and how we as the church can change what's happening in the world. I'm going to put totally all the news and the headlines in perspective for you. In fact, I'm writing a book about this now, and Oxford University said, if you will write this as a thesis, we'll give you a PhD, because they said this is really the right, under this is the understanding of the world we need to get out there. And I said, you know what? Letters after my name are not going to help, help me win souls. <laughs> I'm going to write it as a book, because we need to get this out to the whole church so we understand what's going on in the world so we can change it. But everywhere in the scripture, we see a God who's victorious, not a God who's defeated. Look at this in Isaiah 9. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. It says, and he will be called. See, he's a wonderful God of blessing, blessing, blessing. Wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Our God is a delightful God. And what does he want to do? It says, of the increase of his kingdom. See, this is the heart of God, a God who wants to bless all the nations. Of the increase of his kingdom and peace, there will be no end. See, that's who our God is. He says, I've got all the power in the universe, and I'm using it to always increase my kingdom in peace. The kingdom never stays flat. The kingdom never declines. The kingdom of God, I'm here to tell you, because of our great and glorious God, is increasing in the world every single day and has been since the beginning of time. We've never gone backwards. We're only going forward because our God rocks. There will never be an end to the increase of the kingdom. Why? Because it's the zeal of the Lord Almighty who does it. It's not our zeal. It's God's zeal to get the message of, I'm a God of blessing out to the nations. So God uses his power to get the gospel out, the good news. Uh, even despite all of us frail people, like right now I'm jet lagging and I feel like a total bozo, you know? And my staff would confirm it. Yes, you are a bozo if they were here, right? You know what's the good news in this? Is it's not, it doesn't say the zeal of the evangelists and missionaries and all the church will accomplish the never ending increase of the kingdom. I'm so happy about that because I personally, <laughs> I'm up and down. <laughs> Some days I wake up, I'm happy, like, woohoo! <laughs> you know, good day, let's serve Jesus. Other days I wake up, I'm sad, I'm like, oh, bummer. <laughs> do I have to really do go do things for God, you know? Some days I wake up, it's like, woo, I want to pray, can't wait to get to prayer meeting this morning. Other days I wake up, it's like, oh man, do I have got to talk to God? I don't want to talk to him right now. Some days I wake up, can't wait to read the word, you know, whoa, this is awesome, you know. Other days I wake up and it's like, <laughs> Deuteronomy. It's 
Monday morning. Do I really have to read this? See, some days I wake up, I go, I want to live holy for God. You know, on other days I wake up, I go, sin. <laughs> sin, give me sin, lots of sin. I declare a flesh day, sin, sin, sin. You know, <laughs> some days I wake up, it's like, put on the face paint, let's take India for Jesus. And other days I wake up and I'm like, oh man, bummer. <laughs> If they want to go to hell in India, let them go. <laughs> Bring me breakfast in bed, you know. I mean, that's how I am sometimes. I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. And so are you. <laughs> You're the same as me. So if this never-ending increase of the kingdom depended on us, God would have a huge problem. But the good, good news is it's the zeal of the Lord Almighty working in frail, weak people like us that grows the kingdom around the world. It's awesome news. That's a, a, a scripture of victory. You know what? And you guys, the kingdom of God is growing so fast in the world that even secular, non-believing authors are writing books. Awesome magazine called The Economist, probably the top news magazine in the world. The editors of The Economist wrote this book called God is Back, and how the global revival of faith is changing the world. As unbelievers, they wrote a book because they're saying literally the global explosion of Christianity is changing the entire world, including the economics of the world. So we've got to write about this. See, so the growth of our great God's kingdom around the world is getting the attention of even unbelievers. Here's another one. Just came out, God's Century, Resurgent Religion and Global Politics. This is by international relations specialists. They said, oh my gosh, in international relations, we never teach about religion, but look at what's happening with the growth of Christianity and how it's impacting the world. And so they started researching and writing and they said, oh my gosh, We've got to call this God century. You know, the church is expanding globally in phenomenal ways. Our God is a God who is victorious. He is not a God who's uh, taken by surprise with what's happening in the Ukraine or anywhere else. And when we only get the news from CNN and the BBC and all those people, we're not hearing the true story. We're only hearing the bad stuff. But there's good news of what God's doing, and it totally rocks. The scripture everywhere says what God's going to do. It's, look at this one. The Lord will. He will. He absolutely will. No doubt about it. Be awesome. When, not if, he destroys all, not some, of the false gods of the land. That's who our God is. He has declared there will be total victory for the kingdom of God on the planet in every place People will have access to the gospel, and they'll be able to respond if they want to. And then it goes on to say, and there's nothing that can defeat him. Then it goes on to say, there's a promise to us. The nations on every shore will worship him, everyone in their own land. In Afghanistan, they will worship. In Iran, they will worship. In Pakistan, they will worship. In every country on earth, the scripture said, People will worship God because he's called us to be blessed and then to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. That's the goal. It's not a question of if all the nations will respond to God. The only question is when, and that depends on all of us, what we do. Everywhere the scripture just gives these awesome promises. That's really cool, and I can tell I don't. I have too many slides here. You know what that is? I always do that. I always have too many. That's the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> As of that is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so here, look it. Here's what we're going to do. I want to tell you stories of the power of God from around the nations. In Habakkuk 1.5, God commands us, look at the nations. He wants us to be a nation's people. He's a nation's God. He wants us to be nation's people. He said, look at the nations. Watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe it even if you were told. See, He said, I'm going to be doing something so amazing, you're going to be tempted to disbelief. Okay, But he said, don't do that. Listen, observe. And he said, what you're going to see is the fulfillment of my word, like Zechariah 9.10. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. What part of the earth is left out of that promise? His rule will extend to every single part of the world. That's what 
what scripture says, and I believe it's true. Africa, south of the Sahara, let me show you how that's happening, you guys. It's amazing. In 1900, it was only 3% Christian, just about 100 years ago. But by 1990, it was 50% Christian. By the year 2000, it was 58%. It's now 67% Christian. If you look at that graph, it's going up. That's Isaiah 9, the never-ending increase of the kingdom of God. You will never see a graph that shows the kingdom is tanking. You're only going to see graphs of the power of God. It's increasing. Northern Africa is Muslim, but God is a great uh, work at uh, a great work there in Northern Africa. It's amazing. He's fulfilling what he said in Psalm 72. He said, "He will rule from sea to sea, in the river to the ends of the earth." That's exactly what the other scripture said in Zech Zechariah. It's the exact word for word repeated twice. God wasn't spiritually stuttering. <laughs> he wrote it twice because he wanted to drive it into us that his purpose was to be a blessing to all the nations. My kingdom will go from the river to the ends of the earth. See, you guys, last scripture and I'm done. Jesus said it this way. He said, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not overcome it. God is victorious God. The devil isn't big enough to take on God. We will see the church planted in every place. Jesus said it another way. In Matthew 24, he said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. All authority, every ounce, every pound, every inch, every mile. All, all, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Therefore, here's what I want you to do with all my authority. Settle down in the suburbs, live a good Christian life. Raise good kids and tell your neighbors about Jesus, but only if they ask you first. Is that what Jesus said to do with all his authority? If we wrote the Bible according to how we lived, this is what the Bible would say. But Jesus didn't say that. He said, all authority has been given to me. Go, make disciples of all, all, all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he said, and I will be with you always. Brothers and sisters, we are living in an awesome time. Tomorrow I'm going to explain the world to you. Actually, the world's coming apart at the seams. It's about to explode in the worst possible way imaginable. Don't think things are going to get better. They're going to get worse. I'm not going to get you I'm going to get you depressed tomorrow for about 10 minutes, and I'm going to make you really happy, OK? I'm going to explain the world, and I'm going to tell you the happy bit. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you, we are on the verge of the greatest explosion of the power of God in history if we will rise up. The God who is the God of the nations, who can open doors that no man can close, who has the power to get us into the heart of darkness, that God's about to rock the planet if his church will rise up. And it's all about how we're going to respond. And so here's what I want to do. I think we need to respond in worship over the great, powerful things the Lord's already been doing, you know, in preparation for what we're going to learn in the next coming days. God bless you guys.